Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, at the CCW Sixth Review Conference. This is a side event hosted by Action on Armed Violence. My name is Ian Overton. I'm the Executive Director of Action on Armed Violence, and this event comes supported by the French government, who has kindly worked with Action on Armed Violence, or AOAV, on five improvised explosive device reports that we are presenting and have presented at a number of side events um, at UN Fora um, over the last few years. Um, the pandemic notwithstanding, our first event was about the IED past, present and future. The second event that we hosted was about the precursor chemical materials involved in IED production and reproduction. And the third was about the impact of IEDs on the humanitarian mine action. This event today is called the IED and the propaganda of the deed. Um, and we're looking at the IED's origins from its rise in revolutionary movements in the 19th century, to its use in nationalist uprising in the 20th and its role in conflicts framed in religious terminology in the 21st century. Um, the, um, we have a number of speakers today and thank you all for um, joining us, both speakers and uh, attendees. Um, the, the general way of communicating, please, can be either to posit any questions in the chat and we will address that at the end of the session um, or at the end of the session, um, um, the, 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 then we will open the floor again to chat-based engagement. If you could please mute yourselves if you are unmuted and um, uh, if you um, want to stop your videos, by all means, please do that. Um, to, uh, to, to kick off, off uh, the meeting, um, there will be, uh, uh, we have five speakers, myself included. Um, my name is, as I said, Ian Overton. I'm the Executive Director of Action on Armed Violence. We are a London-based research charity that investigates both small armed violence and <clears throat> explosive violence around the world. And we do a number of reports every year um, on uh, both topics, but with a particular focus on global explosive violence. Um, myself, I have um, written uh, extensively on, on the issue of armed violence and have a book published on gun violence and also on suicide bombing. Um, joining us today uh, are in um, order of speaking, Emily Griffith from AOAV, who will be giving um, uh, 11 years of IED data. Um, Sean McCafferty from AOAV will be talk talking about the structures of IED usage. Yulia Ebner, who will be talking about right-wing IED, IED violence and ideology. And Professor Kalia Meni will be talking about modeling suicide bombing and participation in Boko Haram's insurgency. Um, to um, flesh out uh, some of their CVs before they speak, um, um, Ameni uh, joins us um, with a, a PhD from the UK Defence Academy and King's College London. He was on uh, counterinsurgency operations by the Nigerian army against Boko Haram. And at the University of St Andrews, Ameni uh, today is a lecturer in terrorism and counterterrorism studies. Um, his fourth book on martial race theories in the colonial Nigerian army is co-published by Hearst and Oxford University Press. And a fifth, fifth book called Rebel is forthcoming. Um, Yulia Ebner uh, is a senior research fellow at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, where she leads projects on far-right radicalization and extremism. On the basis of her research, Yulia advises international organizations, security, intelligence agency, and tech companies. She's also completing a DPhil in anthropology at Oxford University and authored the best-selling books, Going Dark, The Secret Lives of Extremists, and The Rage, The Vicious Circle of Islamist and Far-Right Extremism. Um, Sean McCafferty is uh, uh, doing a master's uh, in security, intelligence, and strategic studies at the University of Glasgow Dublin City University and Charles University in Prague. 
Um, Sean holds an undergraduate degree in history and politics from the University of Glasgow and has a wide area of interest, including political violence, extremism and emerging technologies. And Emily Griffith is um, a full time researcher at AOAV who leads the data collection for the Explosive Violence Monitoring Project. Previously worked in as a researcher in the documentary world and as a counter trafficking assistant to the Helen Bamba Foundation. Um, I'm going to pass over to Emily now to present our data on IEDs uh, that have been collated over the last 11 years as part of AOAV's Explosive Violence Monitor. Hi everyone, thank you Ian. I'll just share my screen. I'm going to present AOAV's key data on the global use of IED harm. Uh, since 2011, AOAV has recorded the global casualties of explosive weapon use, gathering, gathered using English language media reports, documenting the deaths and injuries of both civilians and armed actors, and information on the locations, weapon type, target, and perpetrators of these incidents. Uh, this database is called the Explosive Violence Monitoring Project. It is publicly available and searchable via our website. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about our monitor or are looking for data on global or country specific explosive violence. Over the last decade, AOAV has recorded over 375,000 casualties from explosive weapon use. Civilians have by far borne the brunt of this harm, accounting for 73% of total casualties. When explosive weapons are used in populated areas, civilians account for 91% of those killed and injured, compared to 25% in other areas. The defining weapon type of this last decade has been the improvised explosive device, accounting for 48% of the total recorded casualties, which is over 178,000 people. IEDs have caused by far the highest proportion of harm to civilians since 2011 at 52% of all civilian deaths and injuries from explosive weapons, which amounts to over 140,000 civilians. This is followed by air-launched weapons, such as airstrikes and air-launched missiles, uh, which have caused 23% of civilian casualties, and ground-launched weapons, which include shelling, mortar fire, ground-launched artilleries and missiles, uh, as well as grenades. Uh, those account for 21% of civilian casualties. This graph represents the year-to-year -year figures of total and civilian casualties of IED since 2011. Although the global numbers of IED casualties have fallen in the last decade, the proportion of civilian casualties, regardless of the levels at which we're seeing explosive violence occur globally each year, is consistently upwards of 65%. On average, in the last 10 years, 77% of those killed and injured by IEDs have been civilians. The disproportionate level of harm is far worse when IEDs are used in populated areas. 91% of those killed and injured when IEDs were de detonated in populated areas were civilians. Incidents of IED use have been recorded in 102 countries in the last decade. The worst affected countries in terms of civilian casualties of this weapon are Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Nigeria, and Somalia. Collectively, these six countries listed here account for 80% of the global civilian casualties from IEDs. For the fifth consecutive year since 2017, Afghanistan has seen the highest levels of civilian casualties from the detonation of IEDs. We gather data on perpetrator status and name for each incident of explosive weapon use we record. And it is important to note that the reported perpetrator status in 39% of all incidents of IED use is unknown. However, unsurprisingly, 61% of incidents are perpetrated by non-state actors. From this data, we're able to identify the groups reportedly causing the highest levels of civilian casualties through the use of IEDs. These are the Islamic State, the Taliban, Al-Shabaab, and Boko Haram. However, as you can see, we're unable to record the perpetrator group name in the case of 62% of IED casualties, civilian casualties. Non-specific IEDs account for just shy of half the total civilian casualties from this weapon, 48%, followed by car bombs at 40%, roadside bombs with 8%, and multiple explosive weapons at 
That is when the incident involves more than one weapon type, including an IED. In most cases, again, we're unable to record an activation method because it often goes unreported in English language media. However, we do know that suicide attacks account for 43% of civilian casualties from IED use since 2011. Sorry. These civilian casualties are taking place in locations such as markets, places of worship, roads, commercial premises, public gatherings, and public buildings. The red line on this graph represents the proportion of civilians killed or injured by suicide attacks in each location. The location with the highest number of civilian casualties from suicide attacks are places of worship. 66% of civilians killed or injured by IEDs at places of worship have been from suicide attacks. I'll finish up by looking at our data on the intended targets of IED use. Again, it is important to note that in 73% of incidents in the last decade, we've been unable to identify an intended target through media reporting on the incident. However, of the 27 incidents, 27% 27 of incidents in which we've been able to record an intended target, which is a sample of over 3,500 3, individual incidents of IED use, the majority of those attacks, 56%, have targeted armed state actors, such as the military, police, and state security forces. 20% of those attacks have explicitly targeted civilians. Despite the higher proportion of incidents targeting armed state actors, we are seeing a higher level of harm falling upon civilians who, as our data shows, account for over half of the global casualties of IED use in the last decade. I will hand over to Ian now, and again, please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions about uh, our data or in need of specific data points on explosive violence as it relates to your research and work. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm now going to speak specifically about the so-called propaganda of the deed, but I'm trying to put it into a wider context, and to do so, I'd like to um, address something that really came out of our data. And that is that in the last 10 years, the greatest harm from improvised explosive devices uh, to civilians around the world was from suicide attacks uh, in terms of IEDs as a proportion of civilian harm. And this led me to write a book called The Price of Paradise, how the suicide bomber has shaped the modern age. And I'm going to place media and the propaganda of such suicide attacks at the end of this talk. But I want to show that it's not just propaganda on its own. There are a whole variety of threads that lead towards the use of suicide attacks. As you can see from this graph, suicide attacks peaked in 1940 to 1945. Um, this is unsurprising given the Second World War and the use of kamikaze attacks. But it has absolutely gone through the roof in the last 10 years in terms of the um, uh, witnessed use of suicide attacks globally. Um, the spread of suicide attacks has um, been pervasive and has dominated the majority of countries around the world. Um, all those in red have witnessed suicide attacks. Latin America has been largely spared as has Southern African states and Australasia, but you can see that um, particularly North Africa and the Middle East and parts of Russia, um, as well as the US and Europe, have witnessed suicide attacks on a scale in recent years never been seen before in history. In fact, since suicide bombers were first used in 1881, almost 250,000 people have been killed or injured by them, but 40% of those have died in the last five years alone. In 1976, there were no suicide bombers in the world. In 2016, 28 countries saw 469 attacks. So the question is, is why has the suicide bomber become the ultimate propaganda of non-state actors in the modern age? Why are we seeing headlines like this uh, repeated annually around the world? And if we do live in the age of the suicide bomber, how did we get here? Well, I think there are a number of individual reasons that would lead anyone to becoming a suicide bomber. Um, there are claims of um, amphetamine use, stimulant drugs, um, uh, and uh, brainwashing. 
<clears throat> of groups on individuals. There are claims that depression, not ideology, drives suicide attacks. There are claims that um, poverty has an implication in those who may conduct terror strikes. And there are claims that social media, which isn't the articulation of attacks, but the ways in which recruitment can be used, is integral to the suicide bombers' rise. But I would also stop, stipulate that not only do individuals lead towards suicide bombings, many, many various pathways, which can sometimes be unaccounted for and sometimes can be quantified, but there are also very sizable group reasons why, why non-state acting groups might use suicide attacks as a, as a method. One of the framings of suicide bombings in recent years is they're often perpetrated by groups that claim to have an, an absolute understanding of utopian promises, that they promise a utopia. They will, through the deaths of the suicide bomber, um, a world worth living in will be created. Um, it's, it's a terrible um, um, uh, trade-off, in a way, of sacrifice for paradise. Um, and ISIS propaganda in 2015 was more than 50% rooted in utopian articulation. Um, this obviously shifted as they lost territorial ground, where war became their main discussion in social media. But when the rise of um, ISIS began, utopia was very much the framing. And this utopian vision has been present in most non-state actors' application of suicide attacks since they first began in the 1st of March, 1881 in St. Petersburg. Then the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, was killed by a suicide bombing um, in St. Petersburg. The bomber was part of a group called um, the People's Will. And they promised that through the decapitation of the Russian Tsar, that Russia would um, be ushered into a new age of prosperity and peace. Such prosperity and peace is also promised by ISIS militants today. Um, and the vision that they have of the caliphate, um, whilst it has been diminished in recent years owing to strategic losses, is still rooted in the promise that um, their suicide bombers hold up as to why they will sacrifice their lives. But utopia alone does not uh, um, give reason for why there's been such a, a flood. The soldier's weapon is also another um, reason. The suicide bomber is the ultimate, in a way, intelligent weapon. It is a targeted missile that can choose its time and location of destination. It is, in some respects, the poor man's drone. Um, and organizations that do not have the capacity to use that, uh, uh, to use advanced drone technology may resort to suicide attacks. We saw this in Japan in 1944, where the Japanese military on the back step, um, witnessing the advance of the American Navy and losing territory in the South Seas, um, realized that um, they needed to um, offer up a targeted weapon. And in the Philippine Sea, they began their kamikaze attacks. The kamikaze attacks were not there from the very beginning of Japanese militarism, but they evolved in response to losing the upper ground um, in terms of military capacity. Indeed, it was not the kamikaze that first used the soldier as suicide bomber. This came out of the Chinese military in the Sino-Japanese wars and the Sino and the sorry, the, the uh, Sino-Japanese wars and the Japanese Russian war, and the Sino-Russian wars um, in the early 20th century. But um, another theme of suicide attacks is the notion of the martyr. This is very heavily rooted in propaganda ideology and places the martyr at the very center of ISIS's call for action. This is our call of duty, said ISIS's um, uh, fighters, who believe they will respawn in Jana or paradise. Um, and this rooting of martyrdom was possibly first evidenced in Iran in 1980, where a young um, a Shia um, soldier, um, even though the vast majority of suicide bombers today 
form under some form of Sunni form of Salafist jihadism. This was a sheer attack by a young boy who, when faced with the Iran-Iraq war and the onslaught of the Iraqi tanks, threw himself under a tank armed with bombs and blew himself up. He was immediately valorized and turned, golden statues were raised in his name, hospitals were named after him, and he was, val he was um, given a, a valedictory um, uh, framing in popular culture. And this notion of martyrdom, if anyone's been to Lebanon, for instance, you'll know you can visit shops where Hezbollah sells extensive martyrdom videos, and martyrdom has become a fundamental element of the glamour, so to speak, of suicidal terror. And you see martyrs proliferated around the Middle East on billboards and posters. Um, the targeting of civilians, though, is a very recent uh, evolution in terms of the long-term framing of conflict. Um, I'd say in the last 40 years, we've seen a marked increase where civilians have specifically been targeted, and we didn't see this um, in um, mid-20th uh, century warfare, uh, although we did see it with the anarchists in late 19th century Europe. But the um, Salafist jihadist belie belief of taking the so-called kafir's blood um, um, was, uh, has evolved out of a, a tortuous religious framing of the justification for killing civilians that was first witnessed in Israel in April 1994, when um, buses filled with children were targeted in Afula. Um, the argument at the time was that um, um, the people who perpetrated this, which was a precursor to Hamas, believed that any Israeli was a legitimate target because the Israeli state was repressing, they, they believe, their rights. But this notion of bomb blasts, um, I mean, looking at this image itself, you can't help but be reminded of the 7-7 bombings that happened in London. And the notion of the, the attacking bombs, attacking civilians became rooted in a Salafist jihadist conversation. Um, the globalization of suicide terror is also another feature of the modern age. We are all ISIS, uh, ISIS claimed, as they promised a caliphate that would stretch uh, for thousands of miles. Um, but that globalization possibly first saw its most evidential face in the United States in September, um, on the 11th of September, 2001, where um, the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, the, the, the epicenter of globalized um, um, uh, economy, arguably, was targeted. And that uh, uh, attack on global values um, made this, in, in, in essence, a, a conflict arguably of civilization. We cannot also dis um, move away from the fact that there needs to be a strong personality at the heart of many a Salafist jihadist groups. We saw it with Zakawi, uh, we've seen it with other leaders. Um, and this form of cult of personality has cropped up throughout. For instance, in Sri Lanka, you, you saw um, the Tamil Tiger leader um, um, uh, with, with all the idiosyncrasies that one would expect of cult leadership. And cultism seems to be very present in groups that do undertake um, suicide attacks. The other feature of ISIS today is the end of days articulation. There is a belief that suicide bombings is a form of a cleansing, is a form of reigniting uh, or, or reconstituting civilization through a flood of violence. And um, rooted in ISIS's fundamental belief system is that the 11th hour, when almost they have lost the battle, um, Jesus Christ will descend on a minaret in Jerusalem and the second coming will herald a new caliphate where um, uh, um, the Salafist uh, vision of a caliphate will um, dominate. But throughout all of this, the weapon of propaganda is evident. The media's role in amplifying a suicide attack that may occur thousands of miles from you, but still be intimately felt in your living room is absolutely present. And the last 20 years has been witness to repeated front page uh, stories of suicidal attacks in Europe, in America, in uh, North Africa, and in the Middle East. Thousands of people being killed in this almost orgy of violence. 
Um, and such a capturing of the imagination in the horror of the public opinion um, is not too distant from the same source of horror witnessed in 19th century Europe where um, the media covered anarchists blowing up civilians um, in, um, with little regard uh, to life or um, uh, liberty. And um, the, the, the mechanism of ISIS uh, by using a suicide bomber is they know that a suicide attack will garner as much as five times as much media attention globally as an ordinary roadside bomb, sometimes even more. Um, there is probably not one suicide bombing um, in the last 40 years that has not gone unreported. Virtually every single suicide bomber gets captured because of the nature of the horror of what it says to all of us. And ISIS's propaganda is so evolved that um, it then causes a contrarian response from the West, which is a call to arms, um, a call to, 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 to stamp out terrorism. And ultimately it leads towards a situation where um, uh, states um, are engaged in major confrontations to stamp out suicidal terror and suicidal terror finds meaning in the very confrontations created to stamp themselves out. And in a way, um, the, 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 the body feeds itself and violence ends up in this terrible circle. And now I'm gonna throw to Sean McCafferty to uh, um, uh, complete AOAV's research um, in his presentation on the drivers of um, IED terror. Thank you very much, Ian. I'll just share my screen. Everyone hear me okay, yeah? Here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the research that we've been doing over the last year on the propaganda of the deed and the IED and tie it to the sort of structural and organizational factors uh, which are essential in the practicing of this method of violence. So I'll start with the contemporary IED. Now we've seen, as Ian pointed to there, that the fusion of the notions of propaganda of the deed have influenced this idea that explosive violence can have consequences far greater than the direct harm that it inflicts. We've seen it across many examples throughout history that Ian highlighted, and especially, as Emily mentioned, it's been a growing trend in the last 20 years. Now, we looked at one very key point, which is bombings in Lebanon in 1983, as a sort of proof of concept for this fusion of violence in the Middle East. In October 1983, there was the bombing of the multinational forces bases in Lebanon. These killed 241 United States military personnel and 58 French military personnel. The idea was, it was then claimed by the group Islamic Jihad, who claimed responsibility to force peacekeeping troops out of Lebanon. Uh, peacekeeping troops subsequently left in the following months. But this was grasped by many groups and many different violent actors as a success of sorts for this fusion of violence and propaganda. What we have seen as a major development in the last 20 years is the fusion of these concepts with our now increasingly online uh, world, our digitally developed world, which provides an oxygen of radical communication that wasn't possible when these actors relied on the printing press or even uh, just television news. We have seen the IED dominate across most major conflicts in the last 20 years, with growing insurgencies and sectarian conflicts. The war on terror has contributed massively to this as the interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq descended into uh, long-lasting insurgencies and sectarian conflict. As Emily had highlighted, between October 2010 and September 2020, there is a total of more than 171,000 uh, fatalities from IDs recorded globally. We do always highlight, though, that the recording of explosive violence data is very difficult. There are many inaccuracies in these numbers and likely lower than the reality. And the ID has evolved significantly in the last 20 years with variations such as vehicle-borne IEDs and suicide attacks taking on very different characteristics depending on the strategic demands of the situation. As Ian had mentioned, the suicide bombings in Israel to target civilians and buses were an innovative step to breach the extensive security apparatus of the Israeli state. And we've seen many other uh, evolutions of this form of violence to meet certain conditions. Now, it's also important to note that it's deployed by violent groups across the political and ideological spectrum. There has been a dominance in the last 20 years of Salafi jihadist groups deploying the IED, but it has popped up in almost groups from the left wing, the right wing, and all across the spectrum, and it's likely we'll see that uh, as a continuing trend. 
So now I'm going to talk about asymmetric conflict briefly, which is quite an important condition in the last 20 years for the use of the IED. Um, since the end of the Second World War in 1945, we've seen a broad move away from interstate conflict towards intrastate conflict, civil wars and ethnic conflicts and local conflicts um, that are often internationalised. Now, the versatility of the IED is important in this context. Groups often face superior state militaries, and the IED gives them a force multiplier that allows them to compete on the same level with state violence, as Ian said, as the poor man's drone in some sense. Now, if we look at Afghanistan, the US-led coalition outspent the Taliban at a ratio of 500 to 1 and deployed a larger military force at points of a ratio of 11 to 1. But as we've seen in the last year, the Taliban is now back in government and we'll see what happens as far as in terms of potentially a similar situation in the late 90s. Now, across Afghanistan, we've seen more than 2,000 IED attacks in the last 10 years. There were at least 6,625 civilians killed and over 15,000 wounded. Quite an important condition when we think about these conflict zones, these asymmetric conflicts, is the idea of security vacuums. Um, across Yemen, Syria and Iraq in the last 10 years, we've seen state security collapse. And in the ensuing vacuum, violent non-state actors take control of vast swathes of territory and enact unprecedented levels of violence. Now, this is important for the production of the IED, as both in Iraq, Syria and currently in Yemen, IEDs have been produced on a quasi-industrial scale due to the availability of conventional munitions within these conflict zones and also the lack of controlled precursor materials, which makes uh, the production of the IED very easy for groups with certain expertise which exist within these zones. Now, as, I, as Ian had mentioned, the fusion of extreme ideology of this violent economy of means and asymmetric conflict creates an environment for extreme political violence. And it is likely that this form of conflict will continue to dominate in the coming years. I'm going to talk a little bit about the structures, the organizations, and the networks that deploy this form of violence. There is, as I've mentioned, a huge diversity of actors and a variety of organizational motives. Um, but one thing that is really key is that most of the groups that employ IED violence see themselves through this utopian vision as the future political leaders of their communities. They are reshaping the world through their violence. In order to exist, most of these groups have to operate within local communities with either passive or active support. As a result, they play on local grievances and local conflicts to gain legitimacy among populations. This often means that ID violence is framed within the cultural, political or religious messages and symbols that local communities have. And it has proven to be a very adaptable method of violence in this sense. Uh, for instance, when we look at Hamas in Israel, they had stated previously to their attacks in the 90s that suicide bombing was against their the theological framing, but they very quickly changed this framing when it became a uh, functional necessity for them to employ uh, the suicide bombing as part of their violence. Now, ISIS, as we had mentioned, is the largest user of the IED that we've seen in the last uh, 10 years. Again, they mass produced the IED in Syria, and they used particularly a huge amount of vehicle-born IEDs to punch holes in enemy lines and alongside another range of asymmetric strategies to compete with the coalition uh, that was fighting with them in Syria. Now, they also fused this with extreme propaganda, as Ian mentioned, including using commercial drones to capture videos of their suicide bombings and vehicle born IDs. This has led to a mass proliferation of this violent propaganda, visceral propaganda across the internet. One case that's really important is the bombings in Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday of 2019. This was the first Salafi jihadist bombing to take place in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has a complicated history of IED use and has featured many suicide bombings in the past. This was the first one directly inspired by Salafi jihadist ideology and indirectly organized by Islamic State. This is important because it suggests that when groups like ISIS are being territorially defeated and face significant military collapse, they're able to shift to networked and indirect organization. It shows an extreme resilience that we need to be careful of in the future. Another thing to pay attention to is conflicts we've long thought of as solved. The effective peace process in Northern Ireland still has simmering tension below the surface of different communities. And on the 19th of April 2021, an IED was left at a police officer's house in Dunedin. It was defective and did not explode, but this is supposedly the work of distant Republicans. And it is important to think that some of these conflicts will still harbour the potential for a wave of IED violence in the future. There are also increasingly organised far right, far right ne networks that we must be aware of. And again, I'd highlight we need to be careful of the amorphous nature of these groups. They are always one step ahead in terms of their innovation, 
and social media and digital connection inevitably plays a huge role in their recruitment and espousing of their propaganda. Now, to finish up, I'm going to talk about the proliferation of the IED and the future threat here. As we've mentioned, it has grown uh, in its use in the last 20 years, despite the dipping trends and, um, and casualties. And it's important to mention that the IED remains a relatively cheap and highly effective weapon. It's in some ways a very simple and crude weapon, but it's so adaptable and so multifaceted that it, it will continue to be incredibly popular amongst many of our groups. Um, their use, again, yeah, has grown and it accounts for 48% of killed or injured by explosive violence in the last 10 years. It's important to always mention that it's a weapon of innovation and IEDs will evolve alongside emerging technologies and new strategies. For instance, on the 27th of June 2021, an Indian Air Force base in Jammu was hit by commercial drones which dropped and uh, improvised explosive devices. And we'll see, I believe, similar uh, developments uh, in the future alongside these emerging technologies. It is likely also that the IED will spread to other movements and organisations. Because of the statistical weight, we've been focused on Salafi jihadist violence for the last 20 years. Rightly so, will emerge in other organizations in the future, and we need to always be wary of that. Now, due to the IED's unique place in the fusion of propaganda, violence, and innovation, it really necessitates our focus and demands our attention. Um, thank you very much. I'll now pass on to Yulia Ebner, who will uh, expand on this idea that it might spread to other movements and organizations, particularly the far right. Yes, hello. Um, yes, as, as um, Sean just mentioned, I will zoom in on the far right's use of propaganda of the deed and, uh, and uh, explosives. And I would also like to share my screen with you. I hope it works. One second. I hope you can see it now. Yep. Brilliant. Um, yeah, it's it's quite interesting because my one of my first books uh, or my, my first book, The Rage, focused on the parallels between Islamist and far right extremism, their goals, their tactics, their narratives, uh, and also their longer term strategies. And what became quite obvious in the beginning already was that both had the propaganda of the deed as one of their main strategic pillars. So the aim, of course, of any radical uh, terrorist group or any, any radical movement really is to bring about drastic political and societal change. And uh, the, the far right is as much based on apocalyptic beliefs that were mentioned in earlier presentations as jihadist movements are. So uh, for example, a lot of the neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups that I also went undercover with as part of my research for my second book spoke a lot about day X and this uh, looming dystopia so they believe that the justification for violence would be to accelerate this looming war of races or religions or cultures by staging terrorist attacks. And this is very similar, of course, to the jihadist side of the spectrum, where uh, Ian already mentioned this, but this end of times idea is, is very present in their ideology and also in their justification of launching a defensive jihad in order to, uh, yeah, to help uh, the, 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 the jihadist revolution against the Western world in light of this end of times prophecy. And the, the, as you can see in the pictures here, it is a really one of the really important elements in the propaganda of, of both the jihadists and the far right extremists is the glorification of martyrs. And again, Ian mentioned this, this adoration of the martyr on the jihadist side of the spectrum. You can see it on the left side, uh, there's, there's uh, a jihadist that's on the cover of a, of a video game poster. And the extreme right did exactly the same thing. So to some extent, they've been imitating in recent years what has worked on the jihadist side in order to recruit, especially from generation Z and from younger audiences, by making use of pop culture elements in order to really stage their own uh, previous terrorists and their own martyrs as, as heroes of video games. This is Luca Traini, the Italian uh, terrorist who features on, on these video game and, and uh, pop culture covers on the right side. So the strategy is really based on, of course, on terrorizing the enemy. So the terrorist attacks always have, have the goal of, of causing fear and exacerbating societal tensions. But one key element is also propaganda of the deed and inspiring future attacks in order to really to launch a revolution. And in the past, we've, we've observed that radicalization has become a lot more gamified. 
both among jihadists, but also, as you can see from these examples, on the far right extremist side of the spectrum. So they've used uh, a lot of military like language, even hierarchies where you can jump up the ranks if you do a particularly good job within the movement. And a lot of the calls for violence are covered behind satirical content, behind visuals like memes, and also are covered up as, as live action role plays, as LARPs. So some of the, the members of far right extremist communities uh, don't even can't even distinguish anymore between sometimes between what is actually uh, a call to violence and what is still considered a LARP or a joke or simply just part of this this culture of trolling and and fun and entertainment. And this is one of the one of the key dangers. And to some extent, this is present in the jihadist uh, radicalization and and propaganda, but not. I would I would say this is really a, a key characteristic that the far right has pioneered. To a similar extent, the far right has pioneered a new form of, of terrorism. Uh, jihadists and especially ISIS really made very, uh, very effective use of, of gamifying their propaganda, their communications, making that very glossy, all the, the glossy, the big magazines, all these uh, materials that we know that they used in order to radicalize the younger generations. The far right has done that as well, but they got they they went one step further, and they also gamified the act of terrorism them, itself. The first instance of this was the Christchurch case, in where in New Zealand the Christchurch perpetrator attacked two mosques and killed over 50 Muslims. Most of you will probably remember the remember this from from the headlines. But what was interesting to see in the aftermath of this is that there was a a massive um, glorification happening in the online far right extremist networks. A glorification of the of the far right shoot uh, of the Christchurch shooter, where they they painted him as the martyr, but in a very gamified way, because he also used uh, a first person ego shooter angle with his GoPro to to live stream the whole attack. And actually, one of the first comments underneath this live streamed uh, video that he released was, is this a LARP? Is this a live action role play? So again, the lines have become, become really blurry between fiction and reality and between terrorism and trolling. And that's of course, uh, needless to say, really a dangerous dynamic. And this has also led to something that I would call a race for higher scores among um, future terrorists or among the, the violent far right extremist online communities. So this almost video game like propaganda of the deed has caused some people to call for for future attackers to achieve a higher score in their in their lethality rates in the number of victims they they, they shoot dead shoot dead and you can see here in the graphic that uh, this is this was taken from an online far right extremist forum where they give scores to different terrorists and of course Anders Breivik the Norwegian terrorist is still their their ultimate hero who has uh, managed to kill the highest number of victims, but a lot of the a lot of the um, the extremists here are calling for for a higher score and are really inspired by by this glorification of of previous attackers, and that's not dissimilar to to what we saw on the on on the jihadist side and and among ISIS uh, martyrs being really glorified in the propaganda. The uh, one of the uh, probably most interesting cases of this Christchurch effect of, of this copycat, copycat suicide uh, or sorry copycat terrorism that we're seeing on the far right extremist side, this gamified kind of terrorism, is uh, the Halle attacker in Germany, who in 2019, where we saw a whole wave of far right extremist attacks that were inspired by Christchurch, uh, really uh, across Europe but also across North America, for example, the Powell attacker the attacker in El Paso uh, and a few other attackers and also plotted attacks that, that luckily didn't go ahead. But this Halle attacker even drafted a list of, of scores that he gave himself for, for any targets that he would hit. So uh, for different, uh, different targets, but also for different, different methods of, of killing. So this was really terrifying to see. And if he published this in, his, in a kind of achievements list in his manifesto. We also, are seeing a similar type of, of inspirational terrorism, of copycat terrorism among incels and among uh, violent misogynist online communities. So again, there is, there is of course an overlap between 
the white supremacist, white nationalist far right and the, the incels misogynist uh, far right. But it's, it's, it's very interesting that this dynamic is really something, uh, something that goes across ideologies and this type of, uh, of also prop the importance of propaganda of the deed really becomes clear as well in the case of Elliot Roger, who is still perceived as, as a key hero among incels and among um, violent misogynist attackers. Some of the, the terrorists also then use uh, 3D printed weapons. And I would say also for the use of IDs, this is becoming a future threat when you can, when you start to be able to actually uh, print your own weapons. This is of course uh, a new dynamic that I believe we, we have to watch out for in the coming years. But also there have been a lot of, uh, a lot of cases of in general, DIY terrorism among the far right. And there are bomb making instruction manuals, but also instruction manuals for other improvised weapons that you can find online and that are still sometimes found even on the surface web, because they often use code words in order to circumvent the, the takedown measures of, of the tech companies. And here are just a few uh, headlines that I took from the last two years of far right uh, perpetrators and would be terrorists who, who, who collected uh, explosives or who tried to launch or in some cases launched attacks using, using IDs. And uh, according, actually, this is, this is from, taken from the AOAB's statistics. According to, to the AOAB, um, there have been 83 ID attacks among uh, far-right extremist groups or individuals or plotted attack as either successful or plotted attacks in the last decade. So this is really, uh, yeah, I would say a dynamic that, that has not just, that, it, that does not just concern jihadists, but also far-right extremists. Oh, sorry, I accidentally went further. Uh, part of the dynamic is also, can also be explained that we're seeing an increasingly international landscape among far-right extremists. And for example, this is a graphic that shows the users of the violent neo-Nazi website Iron March that has been taken down, but that gave rise to radical, uh, violent far-right cells across the world. And, and this also meant that we saw a lot of recycling of these bomb-making instruction manuals across different countries. And even if some countries decided to take down these, mater these materials, they could often still be accessed via VPNs or via uh, basically just pretending you're in a different location. And there is a whole new international ecosystem of, of online radicalization where a lot of uh, these manuals and these uh, materials for giving you instructions on how to create IEDs are found on some of the fringe platforms that are not concerned with any of the, uh, of, of the legislations or of the, the takedown uh, laws and, and policies introduced by some of the bigger tech firms. For example, in Germany, you have a law where uh, only the bigger tech platforms with over 200 million users have to take down, have to take down radical and, and violence inspiring content. Whereas these smaller encrypted, uh, encrypted channels, but also image, plat image, image boards and smaller forums are still really hotbeds for radicalization and for the sharing of violence inspiring materials. Here's just also another and if look into what these platforms look like. You have alternative social media platforms. You even have, have alternative crowdsourcing platforms where you can raise funds and get donations for radical campaigns. And you even have alternative dating platforms. And so that there is a whole new world and a whole new digital safe haven for violent extremists that is beyond the, the bigger tech platforms that we all know. Uh, COVID-19 has really meant that we've seen a spike in a lot of the radicalization cases. Extremist groups have, have tried to exploit this crisis to, rec to recruit really more members into their, uh, into their communities and networks. And this also meant that we've seen a spike in hate crimes, a spike in, in disinformation, and also more potential for, for violent extremism and especially, uh, yeah, the, the type of uh, the, the propaganda of the deed has has really reached a larger audience in the in the last uh, two years, I would say, since COVID, just because um, the far right extremist network has really reached out to to people beyond their traditional audiences. So they have been able to uh, to also 
widen the, the potential pool of recruits for, for future violent attacks and terrorist, uh, terrorist attacks, unfortunately. Yeah, I think um, we should really focus on both prevention and intervention methods in the future. Uh, of course, internet citizenship is, is a main keyword here and in general education in terms of digital literacy, but also digital civil courage to really see it as all of our responsibility to report content that we see on the internet, to report uh, potentially harmful behavior and, and to really not just apply uh, civil courage in offline spaces, but also to be a digital citizen in, in the online uh, or to be, to be a, a responsible citizen in the online spaces. And the same is true for intervention methods. I believe we still have a lot of potential to really make use of what we know from offline de-radicalization programs and apply that more effectively to some of these fringe boards and these more hidden corners on the internet. Thank you. I will now hand over to, to Omeni uh, for the next presentation. Uh, thank you very much for that, Ilya. Um, let me just pull up my slides to share, please. Okay, um, thank you very much for having me. Um, and so today I'll be talking about uh, modeling suicide bombing and participation in Boko Haram's insurgency. My name is Ameni, I'm a lecturer at the University of St. Andrews. And this is gonna be the key question we will be addressing during my components. Uh, why do people participate in Boko Haram's insurgency? Um, with emphasis on those who become side bombers. And so I'll begin with the hearts and mind thesis. Uh, I'm sure uh, some of us have heard or perhaps even used the phrase hearts and minds before. Uh, this is the idea that there's a virtual tug of war uh, with the population in between and uh, the insurgents on one side and incumbents or the government on the other. And this contest supposedly is for the population's hearts and minds. And winning this battle could swing matters decisively one way or another for the incumbent or for the insurgent. And on the one hand, perceived inequalities might lead parts of the population to reject the government, right? In fact, in a worst case scenario, where a large section of the population is rebellious, conflict might even escalate into civil war. On the other hand, however, if the population can be ideologically and physically isolated from the insurgents, then the thesis goes that support for the insurgency would reduce over time. And so that's the basic principle of the heart and mind thesis. And in both scenarios highlighted, the population support is a key variable. It could lean towards the government or move away from it, depending on government action. Now, in in this case, we see that both the government and Boko Haram generally point fingers at each other, right? In the hope that the population sides with them. Now, there was a time when the debate involving Boko Haram and pro-government uh, Islamic clerics was civil in the Northeast of Nigeria. Uh, today, however, this battle of, of, of ideas has turned violent. So what has Nigeria's government said about winning this uh, battle of hearts and minds to disrupt participation within Boko Haram's insurgency? Uh, just uh, taking a brief quote from uh, the counterterrorism section of the uh, Office of Nigeria's National Security Advisor, the ONSA, uh, they say that, well, we must win the upper hand in this war of ideas. This is an op operative phrase that I'll come back to later on. And to win the hearts and minds of those uh, whom Boko Haram claim to speak and fight for, right? Now, an analysis of the exact uh, idea system of Boko Haram is maybe beyond the scope of this talk. Nevertheless, I will say that from dozens of papers, exhortations, and preaching since 2007, we can deduce that ethnic ties, social and economic incentives, politics, and religion all shape Boko Haram's idea system. So let's now model how demand for this idea system might work. And I'll be talking us through uh, my uh, uh, demand curve of ideologies from my own research. So let's imagine insurgent ideology as a good right, fundamentally an idea, sold in a marketplace. Uh, think of that as a socioeconomic and political environment. And this good 
being sold in our marketplace is being sold to an audience, i.e. the population. Now, what we see is that the more resonant an ideology is, perhaps the government is really just that bad, right? The more people accept this ideology, i.e. buy this good within our marketplace model. Now, in our marketplace model, which I shall soon illustrate, we see that the demand curve is the relationship between radical ideology and the number of people who are open to such ideologies. The y-axis will show the price of the ideology, i.e. those, uh, or rather what those who buy into this ideology have to give in return. And the x-axis shows the number of people willing to take up the ideology at every given point. Now, what we see is that generally the higher the sacrifice uh, uh, um, going up to suicide bombing as the, as the ultimate sacrifice, uh, the fewer the people that would willingly pay that price. However, as we shall also see later on, not all active participants in insurgency are willing. So this is the demand curve of ideology here. Um, and um, I model this in, my, in, in one of my books. And um, I, I basically uh, uh, present this idea that at the very highest price point, i.e. suicide bombing, we see very few people buy into any kind of ideology uh, that, that's so extreme. Uh, but at the lower ends of, of this uh, model, we kind of see that, well, if it's tacitly supporting a terror group where no one knows you actually support them, then more people might support uh, this uh, group in principle. And if we go all the way down to this idea that, well, folks are merely voicing thoughts like, well, there is police brutality, uh, there is corruption, which incidentally, a lot of these groups also highlight when finger pointing against the state. Well, we might see very many people in principle supports uh, this idea system. Now in our marketplace model, the population is the dependent variable. What do I mean by that? It's the variable that reacts in different ways depending on the changes to the independent variable, which in this case is ideology. And what we also see is that demand curve uh, shifts can influence our dependent variable, i.e. the population. But what might cause a shift in the demand curve? And what are the consequences? Suppose as an example, favorable government policies and reforms were introduced, right? So there's police accountability, uh, there's better prospect for jobs, uh, there's better uh, criminal justice systems. Uh, these are all positive changes that will cause a shift of the demand curve to the left. And what happens then? What we'll see is that as the demand curve shifts leftwards, fewer people are ready to buy into the insurgent ideology. And correspondingly, we'll see few or no people willingly become suicide bombers. So if I illustrate this on, on our market, marketplace model, we see that when the demand curve shifts to the left, uh, the number of people at the very highest price point, i.e. becoming suicide bombers, uh, dwindles to practically no one, right? Uh, because the government has basically looked at what's driving the insurgency and has, has tried to kind of uh, kill off those drivers uh, uh, through positive reform. Um, uh, because where people have jobs, where people have prospects, generally they are less likely. Uh, the exceptions, and we'll get there, uh, but this is one way to kind of model this uh, uh, relationship. But what we also see is that the demand curve can also shift right, right? And uh, where you have a brutal counterinsurgency campaign where people are losing their loved ones that had nothing to do with the insurgency, you have extrajudicial killings, you have extreme corruption, uh, then uh, the insurgents ideology might be more resonant, right? And in that scenario, we might see people who have little or nothing left to lose, even willingly uh, become uh, Shaheed. Uh, suicide bombers. Um, uh, and even in the at the lowest levels, uh, more people would agree with the notion that the government is doing very poorly, there's police corruption, etc. Um, and so uh, we kind of see here that it's very important for governments to pay attention to the drivers, so not just the tactics of suicide bombing and, and, and violent action by terror groups per se, but also what are, what, are, what are the things driving these insurgencies and how can we kind of modify this demand curve? However, and this is key, persuasion is just one mechanism of participation, right? We shouldn't run away with the idea that everyone who is a suicide bomber uh, was persuaded to participate. Um, there are other ways by which uh, our folks participate uh, in, in extreme uh, radical groups. 
Um, and figure four, as we'll shortly see, uh, shows the spectrum of participation. Recruitment methods that favor persuasion do feature prominently within the spectrum. However, coercion also plays a vital role. So this is our spectrum. And on the one end, we have abduction as uh, the most kind of potent uh, form of coercion. Why? Because you're effectively taking away the agency of those being abducted. You're forcing them to do what you want. Um, and at the other end, we have intrinsic motivation, right? Those that are abducted and kind of forced into extreme acts like suicide bombing, uh, are, are te they tend to be younger, very much younger. Uh, but those that are intrinsically motivated tend to be older. And in between, you have things like pressure, and pressure could be a, a negative leverage, i.e. threats against family members, or it could be positive leverage, i.e. view and rebellion as a means of livelihood, right? It's very important to kind of look at this spectrum and understand all the nuances uh, that underpin participation in insurgency. Now, some individuals would willfully accept martyrdom and suicide bombing duties. However, not everyone is a willing agent. So this leads to the question, how does Boko Haram manage to deploy unwilling suicide bombers? Now, three mechanisms feature uh, here uh, that are very important, I think, to help us address this question. Extreme coercion, which is kidnapping, substance abuse, and brainwashing or psychological conditioning. Let's start off with kidnapping, right? Kidnapping, again, I kind of highlighted this earlier on. Uh, it's an extreme form of coercion because you are taking away the agency of the abducted individuals. Um, and what we often then see is that those who are abducted are very often locked into the group setting, i.e. it's very difficult to escape. And even if escape is possible, many abductees may have seen family members killed uh, by the insurgents, right? Uh, they may have witnessed villages being burnt down or seen entire communities abandoned or run away from. This then creates the idea that there's no one to go back to, i.e. that the group setting is too powerful. You can't simply tiptoe away from them. And in fact, what we see is that in many instances of rebellion in Africa, it's rare for an escaped rebel to return home and meet everything the way it was. Uh, because terror groups don't just uh, kidnap people in the dead of the night and run away. They also generally destroy villages as well and livelihoods. So in this sense, abductees are a critical component of Boko Haram's calculus of war. After all, a willful suicide bom bomber and an abducted suicide bomber share one thing in common. And what's that? Well, they're both suicide bombers, right? As one Nigerian army officer interviewed put it, well, for those killed or injured by person-born IEDs, do you think it makes a difference if the bombing vessel was willing or coerced? So with multiple instances, hundreds in fact to date, maybe even over a thousand or thousands of kidnapped children and youth, uh, Boko Haram has a large army to kind of uh, pull from of uh, reluctant individuals to employ as bombing agents, um, uh, especially uh, when you kind of uh, see the accounts of escaped and reformed former members. So let's now move to another extreme form of coercion, which is substance abuse as a mechanism of control. So substance abuse uh, uh, is, is something that a lot of military personnel who have uncovered Boko Haram camps uh, will, will kind of talk to you about. And they kind of view Boko Haram as a result of what they found as depraved drug addicted sociopaths, right? And so there's some irony here, right? Because Boko Haram's fighters don't conform to this high moral standard that their false religious doctrine suggests. And uh, substance abuse uh, uh, along these lines has been rife within the movement's rank and file. And this point of drug abuse in particular is generally overlooked within a debate on the internal workings of Boko Haram. And is problematic insofar as this organization has employed narcotics as a tactical force multiplier. Now, what do we mean by this? It means that drug abuse or substance abuse, I should say, hasn't uh, just been employed for recreation per se, but it's been employed to inhibit violence and control stress, especially amongst the younger inexperienced members. Now, Nigerian Army reports have listed uh, uh, Oxycontin as a substance recovered from Boko Haram on several occasions. Now, this is not illegal in Nigeria. However, it requires a prescription as it's a common abuse substance. 
a class of drug within the opioid family, and it generally changes the way the brain and nervous system respond to pain. Simply put, it reduces sensitivity to pain, uh, thus uh, lowering the pain threshold. And it also inhibits anxiety and provides a narcotic high, effectively uh, presenting feelings of euphoria. Uh, now, for these reasons, oxycontin is highly addictive among substance abusers. Now, three division of the Nigerian army also in the past has confiscated uh, large quantities of more widely available substance abuse, or rather abuse substances, uh, cannabis, uh, chloroform, and, and, and tramadol were amongst the seized substances. Let's just linger a bit on tramadol, right? Uh, again, a synthetic opioid-like drug used as a painkiller, um, already illegally abused by jihadists in Libya. And in Syria, it's uh, generated millions of dollars. It's, it was that widely employed by Daesh, the Islamic State. And uh, in fact, they are referred to as jihad pills, right? And uh, employed as a stimulant to heighten resistance to physical pain. Now, in the case of Boko Haram, there has been evidence of tramadol abuse within the group's ranks. And interview data also suggests that some of the few field Boko Haram bombers appear to be out of it. Right now, these individuals may have accepted to act as suicide bombers, or maybe they didn't accept to do so. What we can say, however, is that whether willing or unwilling, an, uh, uh, um, a, uh, an abuse substance will still have the same effect on an individual. So, in the incidence of substance abuse within Boko Haram drunk, we see kind of a departure here, right, from this idea that some jihadists join terror movements to be part of the excitement, right? Or just wanna be uh, the uh, big man uh, with the gun. Um, okay, so let's move to the final uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, item of note here, uh, psychological conditioning, right? Now, Boko Haram's coercive uh, uh, mechanisms uh, also include psychological co uh, conditioning. Um, and the aim here is to uh, likely uh, entirely desensitize fighters, even especially very young ones, to the horrors of war. Now, combined with substance abuse, uh, this kind of conditioning is a potent control mechanism. It is one that makes young fighters more malleable, less sensitive to extreme acts of violence. And a suicide bomber along these lines might be drugged, conditioned, or both. For instance, Boko Haram tries to collect uh, the bodies of the militants sl slain in action, and they specifically use very young children around the age of 11. And this intentional exposure of the very young to mutilated human corpses uh, is likely to have a major psychological impact over the years as these kids grow into more violent roles within the group setting. And the actions above are consistent with studies on the explo uh, exploitation, I should say, of child rebels by armed groups. So not only do rebels expose minors to the horrors of war from a very young age, but child soldiers are also exposed to violence in popular uh, uh, culture, such as movies. We uh, heard uh, Yulia talk uh, quite a bit about this, uh, this uh, role of popular culture in, 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 in radicalization movements. And uh, a lot of folks along these lines aspire to reenact such heroic behavior. And this uh, um, um, exposure is something that uh, is particularly prevalent uh, amongst very young kids in the case of Boko Haram. And this again takes us back to the big man with the gun thesis. Um, in fact, we see that within Boko Haram's group setting, uh, young boys were encouraged to watch American war movies and they shared for the US soldiers. Um, and they said that these are the kinds of things that they want to replicate. So uh, just kind of uh, uh, moving on to the end of this presentation, how has Nigeria's government responded to these conditioned fighters? Well, since 2016, uh, Nigeria has run Operation Safe Corridor, uh, a counter-radicalization program, which has accepted hundreds of repentant Boko Haram fighters. Now, there are three categories of fighters and victims, I should add, uh, relevant to this uh, uh, demobilization, disarmament, rehabilitation, and reintegration program. Category A are victims or ordinary folk caught up in the conflict. Category B are those former um, uh, members who willingly surrender and open to rehabilitation. And category C are hardliners beyond rehabilitation uh, who uh, remain at 21 Armored Brigade, uh, Giwa. And so what we see is that uh, category A and B are transported to Malam City um, um, 
uh, at a, an army run uh, de radicalization camp in Gombe State. And the experience of many of these ex members indicates that the uh, extent of conditioning and drug addiction is significant. These are very damaged young uh, uh, men and women that kind of emerge from Boko Haram's group setting. Uh, uh, suffered extreme mental trauma. Now, Operation Safe Corridor is meant to de-radicalize and reintegrate them into society. The question I've kind of asked myself looking more and more into the research is, is this the same as addressing uh, the mental trauma experience within the group setting? Now, moreover, there, there were recent reports that some of these ex-members were taken in by Operation Safe Corridor, but may have returned to Boko Haram. Now, why would anyone do that? or perhaps due to frustration uh, in their new lives in the camps, right? Or perhaps due to the fact that Nigeria's uh, uh, promises for reintegration uh, were perceived as empty. So a uh, final reflection. Overall, we see that the spectrum of participation in Boko Haram's insurgency, especially where the price of participation is extreme, uh, say at, at the level of suicide bombing, it's very nuanced. Yes, our marketplace model holds some explanatory power, uh, but there's also a need to consider the coercive mechanisms of participation uh, going beyond the use of persuasion. Indeed, some ill-informed youth might join these movements to be part of the excitement, but there are several other reasons why many end up with these groups, particularly where extreme action against suicide bombing is the price of membership. I want to thank you very much for having me in today's session. I mean, that was excellent, and Yulia as well, and Sean, and I'm, I'm, I've learned a great deal, even though I've spent years myself reading around these issues on, on all of those cases. We've had um, three, three questions raised. I'll, I'll take them in, in uh, or three themes as well. I'll take them in turn, and if there are any other questions, actually, and there's one, um, there's a few more now have landed directly to you, Ameni. Um, we'll start off with the very top about statistics on drone IEDs. Um, I'll quickly answer this in terms of we don't have any specific ones on drone IEDs because they come under our general catchment of um, airstrikes. But I would say that, that the, there's a kind of a challenge. Drones may well become a very dominant feature of non-state actors' application of violence. But um, the the... the the strength of the suicide bomber, for instance, the idea that if a cause is worth dying for, it's a, it's a cause worth fighting for, will mean, I think, that the suicide bomber, the physical presence of the fighter on the battlefield, will still be uh, very dominant. I think drones do present quite an existential crisis for states that use them extensively because it sort of questions notions of heroism that is rooted in um, many a military and a non-state actors framing of the virtues of their engagement. And I think if you get to a situation where non-state actors are using drones, it eviscerates their argument for moral superiority evidenced by heroic deeds in battle. So yes, they may be used strategically, but I think there's a counterweight um, in terms of the propaganda of the deed of their effectiveness. Um, the next question was about current standards on the use of force in conflicts for IEDs. Um, and I, um, we are going to be doing a fifth talk, which will be around April next year, um, again hosted by the French government, which is talking about what the UN should do in terms of recommendations to addressing IEDs. So everyone on, who's attending on this talk will be invited to that. But one thing I, I might want to just say is that the improvised explosive device um, is the dominant form of non-state actor weaponry in the 21st century. It is also the dominant form of explosive violence in the 21st century. And um, I do think that um, the claim by some in the humanitarian mine action setting that, as has been stated by one major demining, that, and I quote, the majority of IEDs are in fact landmines, is not true. That there are huge numbers of IEDs that are not landmines, 
And as a consequence, the landmine protocols, um, are, um, or such as um, the prohibition of victim acts of antipersonal IDs by the Otto Convention, are insufficient. Furthermore, the spread of improvised explosive devices um, around the world and their engagement by humanitarian mine action groups to, to defuse them is in danger of politicizing those very groups, not necessarily um, in the eyes of the reasonable, but in the eyes of the Salafist jihadists. This year, we've seen a large number of D-miners killed in Afghanistan, over 10 in a single strike. We have reports of 23 D-miners working for one single agency in Yemen, having been killed since 2018. And D-miners are increasingly becoming the victim of targeted attacks because of the fact they are engaging in um, trying to, to demine IEDs laid down by non-state actors. And I do think that this is raising some fundamental challenges to the demining sector. And I applaud the French government for addressing IEDs head on at conventions like the CCW. Um, the next question um, was um, uh, directly uh, posited Actually, on this issue, on both drones, on drones, can I throw to Yulia and Ameni? Um, Yulia, um, have you seen drone strikes being used by right-wing groups at, at all? Not really, to be honest. It's it's something to keep in mind potentially for the future, but I, I assume that it's also, it is a bit of a, a power issue. I don't think that uh, far-right extremist groups or individuals even less so have had the the capacity really to uh, to launch drone strikes, um, but of course now that the use of drones might become more more easily accessible or drones in general more easily accessible, more commercialized, I do think that is that is a potential for future future violent attacks uh, also among far right extremists. I've seen discussions, however, I've not seen the, the, the explicit use of it, but I've seen discussions um, of of launching drone attacks. Yeah. Uh, Ameni, have you seen um, drone strikes being used by Boko Haram at all? Uh, no, I mean, they've shown rudimentary drone capabilities, rudimentary uh, in the sense that these are just uh, custom DJI drones uh, that you can purchase. Um, there, there's a large custom scene around that company's uh, drones. I mean, I've, I've built a couple of them myself years and years ago. Uh, I, I'll imagine it's advanced significantly since then. Uh, yeah, so Boko Haram has kind of shown propaganda to kind of just highlight the fact that they do have drones flying around. Uh, but to have um, a drone kind of take pictures from the sky is one thing, to weaponize them and to conduct a strike, as you call it, is quite another. So the answer to your question is no. Thank, thank you. Um, the next question is, is directly to you from Enrique Garbino, who um, I'd like to say Enrique has been um, a persistent um, attendee at many of our events, and I'm very grateful for his intervention. So welcome back, Enrique. Um, so as to you, Ameni, what are the consequences of popular support to Boko Haram's use of coercion of suicide bombings? And um, Enrique references particularly the, the backlash that the IRA suffered when they um, tied their victims to car bombs and forced them drive, to drive through army checkpoints. Is, is there a, 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 a backlash in Nigeria? Yeah, I think um, Boko Haram's pivot towards suicide bombing has uh, effectively uh, kind of isolated the group even further. Uh, Abu Shekau, uh, who was the leader of the JAS faction, who was killed in May this year, uh, was someone who very much uh, emphasized martyrdom operations. Um, and specifically, you know, employed women, children, pregnant women. And this was something that was, you know, even highlighted by uh, the less extreme, I would say, uh, Islamic State West Africa faction. Uh, and it, it was these uh, ideological differences that kind of led them to eventually assassinate Shekau. So it was a major internal food, this uh, uh, issue of, of, of extreme violence and suicide bombings and who can, uh, who qualifies uh, to be a suicide bomber, but also who should be targeted uh, to the question. Um, and th this idea that just anyone was was kind of fair game was something that uh, several uh, factions in Boko Haram, several people within the opposing faction in Boko Haram did not agree with, right? Uh, they said, well, Suicide bombings can be used, but only specific people can be suicide bombers, and only certain targets were legitimate. Uh, 
um, and Chacal disagreed, right? Chacal basically argued that, well, as long as you live in a land that's run by democracy and that you aren't actively fighting the, the democracy, that makes you a fair target, even if you're Muslim. Um, and so there were major disagreements there. So again, to answer the question uh, succinctly, um, it, there was a major backlash against Boko Haram's uh, use of, of suicide bombings. And actually, since we've seen the death of Shekau and kind of this uh, uh, preeminence of the Islamic State West Africa, uh, we've seen uh, much fewer suicide bombings overall. And I don't think we've registered any pregnant women suicide bombers anymore. Um, I'd like to throw that again as a concept over to you, Yulia. Um, is there a, um, a point at which the right-wing terrorism will not pass? Is, is there anything that has become taboo within right-wing terror activities? Or is it still open game? Anyone can do whatever they want in the name of, of the terror? That's an interesting question. Uh, there are some far right extremist groups that have a very exclusive, uh, that have created very exclusive subcultures and where they have certain tactics and also justifications of violence and justified targets that they that they discuss and where there is definitely a kind of a moral, if you call it more of a moral framework within uh, that extremist space that that exists. But uh, a lot of the and there is there are I have to say there it's also a much more fragmented and and splintered landscape than than we see on the jihadist side. So the, there are often actually divisions that are caused by terrorist attacks, where sometimes in in the aftermath of a terrorist attack, some groups would even fall apart because some members say, "Oh, this is really going too far. I can't believe um, one of us actually attacked civilians." Uh, or one of us even used violence uh, because this was always supposed to be about just joking about violence, but never actually uh, translating these words into action. So there's there is a bit of that and others who might then glorify the attackers and are completely sitting on the other side of the fence. So uh, it's interesting to, to watch those dynamics uh, and, and they're constantly evolving now in the light of Corona and of the pan global pandemic we do see a lot more aggression in the language and a lot more proneness to violence in general among members. So I believe there is a big issue around just frustrations that have built up where the use of violence is a lot more uh, justified within those circles now. And, and, and it, it, it reminds me of once talking to actually somebody in the military and they pointed out just how young everyone in the military often is. I mean, you're talking about a very high turnover and a renewal that's pushing through. And I, I think often um, we, we, we for, it's easy to forget just so, some of these people who join right wing groups or uh, ascribe to right wing movements. They are maybe 17, 18 year old. And, and after two, three years, there's a new cohort of 17, 18 year olds who are willing to come, who may, you know, have more extremist views or may have forgotten the, um, uh, uh, the horrors of previous uh, attacks that could have caused divisionalism. So there's a constant renewal in this. And um, I, actually, I think that this, uh, to some degree, leads on to the next question, which is um, actually back to you, Ameni, but I think I'll open it also to Yulia and Sean um, to, to sort of address um, issues about persistence in terror attacks. So um, specifically to you, I Amenin, mean, here, why has Boko Haram terrorism persisted in Nigeria? But I think I'd also like to hear from Yulia and Sean afterwards about other instances about persistence in the face of coordinated military campaigns. Uh, I, think, I think the cheeky response would be read my second book, uh, Insurgency uh -huh. and War in Nigeria. Um, but a bit more seriously, um, look, this is this is war avoidance uh, we're talking about here, right? So, uh, a how how is it put here? A, a uh, sustained military uh, sustained military operations uh, work very poorly against war avoidance. Uh, you're fighting a conventional enemy uh, that deploys along conventional lines uh, with motorized infantry and all that. Then it's kind of uh, easier to deploy along similar lines and then the bigger and the better battalions uh, win, as was uh, once said during the Nigerian Civil War. Um, but you aren't fighting battalions uh, uh, organized along uh, conventional lines. Uh, you're fighting a group that has evolved its doctrine of war avoidance and given this new meaning in Nigeria. And uh, traditional militaries, and I write extensively about this, are notoriously hard uh, to kind of change your doctrine, concept of operations, and and and, and approach to to kind of uh, uh, tactics uh, just uh, readily. And uh, this is no different in the case of Nigeria. Uh, that's the short answer, but I think it's a bit more complicated than that. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, Yulia, um, you know, again, with right wing terror groups, um, you know, the, the great strength of police engagement and counterterrorism units in the West, for instance, how come these can still proliferate and still survive despite such surveillance and intervention? Because we also have very strong privacy uh, protections in, in Western, in most, of, in most of the European and North American countries, as well as in Australia and New Zealand. So that means that, of course, they can still uh, communicate and, and sometimes go under the radar of the security forces because the security forces are having an increasingly hard time actually now that the big tech firms have removed a lot of the violent extremist content, which is a good thing because that means they have a lower, a much, much uh, lower reach or much lower volume that they can turn out to radicalize no normal people, normies. Uh, but it also means that they've really managed to build up their own communication channels where often if you're not undercover in those channels, you might just never be aware that they even exist or that they are even plotting attacks. So that has really made them be able to sustain those uh, much more underground communication channels where they, where some of the the conversations are a lot more radical, a lot more about violence. And there are even Telegram groups, especially because uh, Telegram, unfortunately, as uh, an app doesn't really makes as as big of an effort to take down far right extremist channels as they have done in the past to take down jihadist channels. So there are even groups that call themselves terror terroring right wing terroring on Telegram, and so that should show up in the identification mechanisms of uh, companies such as Telegram. But unfortunately, uh, we're seeing that they're still very good at coordinating behind the scenes. And and Sean, um, in your research, why do you think persistence? Um, occurs? Why, why, ha, why did the war on terror not eliminate, so to speak, uh, the, the Salafist jihadist groups, you know, swiftly? Why did it drag on for, de for decades? So I think the, the problem is that if you think about the interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan, they're initially incredibly effective military campaigns. But the doctrine of hearts and minds that many mentioned earlier is attempted to be implemented by many of the militaries, but it really isn't um, implemented in the way that the doctrine would suggest. So alongside trying to convince a population that you're going to engage along rules-based engagement, proportionality, win them on site, build state building, there's drone strikes and mass civilian casualties as well. And I think this alienates huge portions of populations. And I think if you think about Afghanistan, it's the reason why the insurgency there has been so resilient. And I think a bigger problem coming out of that is this shift that we'll now see towards distance warfare that's also part of this. So the effectiveness of IEDs in Afghanistan, uh, killing 48% you know, of U uh, UK military personnel, really moves away from population-centric security measures. So at the start of the war, you have patrols, and battalions on foot who engage with the population and try to learn about the population they're trying to convince, but they're very quickly put inside armored trucks by these bombs and then eventually they essentially don't exist and indigenous forces and drone strikes are used at an increasing rate. And I think that alienates again. Uh, and I think the key example for that for me is what happened at the Hamid Karzai airport this year, and that you have a suicide bombing that can only really target majorly civilian populations. I think it, the way that we're moving leaves a vacuum of hard military targets for many of these organizations, and that just recenters them on the civilian again. And if the response to that is more drone strikes, um, I think it leaves us in a very complicated place uh, as far as the way warfare is moving. This is, this is all very much food for thought, and um, we, we're coming up to time now on this um, side event. So I just want to thank all of the panelists. Um, it's been really illuminating for me, and I think we've had such a broad uh, reach from 1881 right through to the future, in a way, from Eula and Ameni's um, contemplations on what next may occur. And can I uh, encourage uh, all of those on the call um, to sign up to AOAV's um, uh, newsletter on our website so we can inform you um, as to the next discussion, which will be happening next year, which is uh, some recommendations as to what can be done to stop uh, what I could classify almost as the, the true weapon of mass destruction of the 21st century, which is the IED. But thank you all again to the panelists. Thank you for those who have listened in um, during your lunch break. And um, may uh, the CCW uh, flourish um, over the next few days um, uh, with um, uh, interventions. And thank you um, absolutely to the French government and uh, um, UNMAS for their um, kind and continuing support on this project. Thank you all.
And Emily has placed the full report on there, but it's also on the front page of our website. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.